Well, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon to those of you here in Michigan. Good morning to our guest, Peter, who's joining us um, from okay. California. Um, my name is Amanda Sewell. I'm IPR's music director. Glad to be your host today. And let me introduce our guest for this conversation this hour. Peter Miles is a film music editor. He's originally from Nova Scotia and he studied at Interlochen Arts Camp and Academy the New England Conservatory and Northwestern University. He's worked as a professional trumper, trumpeter and was also a producer at Delos Records for albums by, among many others, Jean-Pierre Rampal, the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center and the Westminster Choir. Now he's a film music editor and has worked with composers including John Williams, Raman Jawadi, and Hans Zimmer. You can hear his work in films from the Harry Potter, Star Wars, and Jason Bourne series. And in fact, we're going to look and listen some of his work uh, a little later in this conversation, some before and after work. So uh, please join me in welcoming Peter Miles. Yay. Hello, good morning. I hope you Thunderous. are all well. So um, Peter, we're gonna kind of just tell them your story. Um, and you came to Interlochen in the 80s. Are we allowed to say when you were here? Yes. Uh, yes <laughs> <you can. laughs> um, as, a, as a trumpet student. And yeah, so, I, so I, I, I grew up in Nova Scotia and I heard about this place, Interlochen. And I didn't really know much about it. But I said to my parents, well, can I apply to this summer camp? It looks like this amazing thing. And they said, sure. I mean, I don't know that we, we can afford it, but sure. So um, I, I had a trumpet teacher at a local university help me and I made an audition tape and I sent it in and much to my surprise, I was accepted into the orchestra program. So I talked to my parents about it and Interlochen was extremely generous and gave me a scholarship that made it possible for me to go to the camp. And um, I went to the camp that summer. I mean, and it, it was, I mean, to say that it was eye-opening would be the understatement of the century. I mean, this was like a whole thing. I mean, I played in the Nova Scotia Youth Orchestra and stuff like that, but this was a whole other deal. And I mean, it was really a fantastic experience. And while I was there, it turned out that they needed a few more trumpet players at the academy. So um, I auditioned uh, for John Lindenau and the, you know, the academy was extraordinarily generous and gave me a scholarship that made it so that I could afford to go. Because, you know, I, I mean, growing up in Nova Scotia, my father was an Episcopal priest and my um, mother was a school teacher. So it wasn't like, you know, we were not in a financial situation where they could afford to just send me off to boarding school. So I went to Interlochen for my senior year. And, and it, it turned out to be a very special year. Uh, I think it was an anniversary year. And so the orchestra went, we, we did a little tour and, and, and played at the Kennedy Center and the Lincoln Center. And um, uh, with Ben Zander, I think, as the conductor. And um, it was an, an incredible year where I gained access to things that I, I wouldn't have even known about growing up in Nova Scotia. I mean, you know, the internet wasn't around, so you would hear about things, but you wouldn't necessarily know that certain schools were places to audition at, you know, the whole audition, figuring out how to get into college, all that kind of stuff was stuff that, that frankly, um, I, I wouldn't have really known what to do. I might've applied to a few places, but you know, it, it gave me access to things that I wouldn't have had access to or even known about in Nova Scotia. So here's a question. When you, um, when you were a senior at the Arts Academy, you're auditioning for school and you eventually went to the New England Conservatory. At that age, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, I, think I wanted to be an orchestral trumpet player. And that's, and that's what I wanted to do. I don't know if I really understood what that meant. <laughs> but, but, but that's what I wanted to do and or do chamber music or whatever and um and and it you know the, the nice thing about the arts academy is that they also had a big band that you could play in which which i think was a great experience just to learn some flexibility and and not be doing just one thing 
and there was chamber music and stuff like that. But I wanted to be an orchestral trumpet player. And so I went to NEC and, you know, spent four years at NEC and did some of the summer programs, the usual stuff, Aspen, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I got my master's degree at Northwestern and, 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 and sort of freelance for a year after that. But as a Canadian, I had an issue, which was that I needed to, at some point in time, get some sort of work visa or whatever to stay in the States. And that's where I had sort of had all my relationships um, professionally and personally and everything else for, for a long time at that point. Um, so I sort of had a choice between going, going into a doctoral program somewhere or going and working at this record company. And, and the funny story in the short version of this, which is, is sort of been my entire life, I met somebody at the Music Academy of the West who had gotten a double degree at Indiana University in music and recording engineering and had worked at Delos Records. And he no longer worked there. He had moved on to work as a sound supervisor at um, Sony. But he said, you know, I think they're looking for somebody. So it was like, do I get my doctorate or do I get my sort of visa situation straightened out and try out this record company job? So I decided to go with the, rep, with the job just because I felt like you could always go back to grad school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I went to work at Delos and the job initially was editing where they would give you all the takes from a recording session and a score and you would put together the best possible recording. Now, and it, you didn't have, I mean, you didn't really have any sort of editing experience before you took this job, right? They, they hired you based on your, on your performance musicianship and your education and your relationship with, with the, the former employee. Yeah. Like, well, 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 just by my basic, you know, the fact that I had as a performer subbed with the Chicago symphony and played with the Sarasota opera for a season and stuff like that meant that I understood at least, and, and, and with the CSO, I actually, we made a recording also of the Firebird with Boulez. So there was, there, there was some, you know, I had at least some experience and had an idea about what that was all about. Um, I had been a, a Solfege TA at the New, New England Conservatory, and there was a lot of score reading work and stuff that happened as part of that. So I was comfortable reading a score. So, they sort of hired me because of my basic musicianship and the fact that I was had some experience as a performer and <clears throat> was comfortable reading a score. And so for our for our young musicians out there who are who are wondering why do I have to take music theory when all I want to do is perform or why do I have to take oral skills? You're answering that question for them right now that like you you may need these in a professional context later. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah no, <clears throat> exactly. I mean, if you want to be a, um, a fluent musician, that's the wrong word, but you, you know what I mean? If, if you want to be flexible, I had a, a uh, Solfest teacher, who's, I think his keyword was flexibility. And if you want to be flexible, and I can give you an example of that, you know, I went to the record company, I started out just editing, because learning the software was not such a big deal, but, but learning how to put something together, obviously, so that, you know, tempos matched, and you weren't screwing up the phrasing, et cetera, et cetera. And there might be, I mean, we would edit for months. I think when I edited um, the Brandenburg Concerti, I did it for two months. And this is like taking the theoretical model that if there is a better performance of two bars, use it. Now, obviously you need to be sure that phrasing and all those other things aren't affected by that. And, and, and you were getting ultimately the best performance. But working at the record company, you know, everything connects in a way. Working at the record company it taught me about recording sessions so that when I ended up in the film business, I was very comfortable with all of that because I'd already been involved with that. So at the record company, I started out editing and then eventually they gave me some projects to produce. So I worked with the guitarist, Paul Galbraith. And I think I did Jean-Pierre Ron Paul's last few records. Oh, I have, I have a stack of your work here on these oh, vintage oh. CDs for our, for our, uh, let's see, we have uh, Andrew Litton and the Dallas Symphony, this lovely space music, which I'm sure has the planets on there. Yes. And yes, uh, Flummerfelt and the Westminster 
and, Guam, and like this, Guam's record, yes. This is a huge variety of music too. Jean Pierre Ron Paul, you said the Brandenburgs. I mean, you're doing everything from giant the planets to these coral pieces are you what was the media media medium that you were using at the time it wasn't was it past tape were you splicing well, tape we were, we were we were using um the sony dae 3000 which was two like quarter inch tape machines basically and they and they would work in concert with each other and then part way through my time there we got sonic solutions which turned out to be huge for me because sonic solutions was this really great sounding editing program and as the record business started to collapse back around 1998, um, it became obvious to me that I was going to have to find myself another line of work. So one day I was talking to my old trumpet teacher, um, I'm sure you won't mind me mentioning his name, Tim Morrison, who had taught me at the New York Conservatory and had played all those solos for John Williams on Born on the Fourth of July and JFK, et cetera, et cetera. And he had left the Boston Symphony to come to Los Angeles to do studio work. So we were sitting down one day having coffee or whatever. And um, I said to him, hey man, would you give my resume to John Williams music editor? Now, I, I didn't really know what the job was, but I just knew that it was a job in the film industry. And you know, the film industry was not suffering the same malaise as the um as the record industry so long story short he sent my resume to ken wanberg who was john's editor and i got a phone call the next day and and kenny said hey i would love to meet you for lunch why don't we meet at shea new in toluca lake and we'll, which was right by the universal lot where john's bungalow is and let's We'll meet for lunch and have a conversation. So I went over and we met for lunch and he said, look, I've been using magnetic tape my whole career, but now is the time that I need to switch to digital. And I want to use this program, Sonic Solutions, which you know, and John works a lot like the way you work in the record business where he'll record multiple takes that you'll put together for each cue in the movie. And, um, if you can be my hands, I'll teach you how to be a music editor for film. So, I mean, it was, I mean, from the standpoint of what are the odds of something like that happening? I mean, it's in, it was an incredible combination of timing and luck. Yeah, and, and, and you and, knew the, it's funny because you knew the new technology in the context of a field that was dying, as you said, or changing, I guess, but- changing. Yeah, sure. And, sure but that gave you the jump into a brand new field. So yeah. I started out as Kenny's assistant and we did a little movie called Stepmom, which was a rescore job, as I recall, that John had, had taken over. And then we did the first Star Wars movie, episode one, not the first Star Wars movie, obviously, but, but episode one. And we Before sort of went on from there. And I, I was an assistant and we did Angela's Ashes and The Patriot and AI. How old were you on that first on that first job, if I can ask? I mean, you're still like a young guy. Like um, I, I, I was I'm 52. So I was around 30. I mean, did you have a moment where you were like, holy cow, I am working on a John Williams like I mean, <laughs> but just I mean, it's, it's no, I mean, the first time I didn't I don't remember going to the first sessions, but I remember starting to edit the main title of Star Wars for episode one. And that had just been recorded at Abbey Road with the LSO and thinking to myself, wow, geez, what is, this is crazy. <laughs> um, so, so, so there was, yeah, I mean, that, there was that moment. I mean, the work is very strenuous and um, it's long hours and all that kind of stuff. So I think that, the sort of, you don't get caught up in the glamour of it too much because you have to just like get down to work. But it, it was not it was not lost on me that this was an incredible experience. And then as we got very busy, um, Kenny and I would start to switch, switch off on projects. So I, I worked with John on Minority Report while Kenny was dubbing a Star Wars movie up at Skywalker Ranch 
And then as soon as he was done and the recording sessions for Minority Report were done, I flew to London to work for six months on Harry Potter 2, while Kenny took care of the mixing, the final mixing of Minority Report with Steven. So, and that, and that was sort of how the career <laughs> launched. I mean, and this, I mean, you are right out of the gate. You're, I mean, you're working with John Williams and Steven Spielberg and the, at the, these, major franchises it's just it's just amazing to me that you know. I was very fortunate I mean it was totally the right time in the right place and some decent preparation I guess and clearly um, you're very good at what you do because you know if you wouldn't have had a second job if you <laughs> yeah I mean I think well, you know as a young buck I was probably too eager by half at times etc cetera, etc cetera. but I, I think that because there was no, you know, it's like anything else. I, I started to learn how to navigate the politics of it all and what your role was and dealing with different personalities because there is a lot of politics on the film. Any yeah. film as you know, you have the studio, different entities, you have the studio, you have the um, director, you have the producers um, and, and everybody may not be on the same page about some things. So, you know, trying to sort of navigate all of that and make sure that the end result is something that is satisfactory or, or try to help. I'm not saying I don't create the end result, but trying to help um, everyone understand and, and get on the same page so that we can come up with something that everybody's happy with. Trying to help facilitate that is a big part of the job. Well, let's let's talk about that process. And we're we have uh, clips from the uh, Jason Bourne film, which I believe is the most recent in the Bourne series that you worked on. Um, and we have the version um, before music and the version after music. Do you want to so talk to us a little bit about the process, and then we'll watch yeah, them? I'll talk about the process for sure, and then we can watch them. So when you start a film, usually you'll start at the point that they've just finished shooting, or in the process of finishing shooting and they're putting together an editor's assembly or the director's cut. So the, the processes of, of a film are they shoot, then you usually have an editor's assembly, then the director can see the assembly of all the work that they did and they and director's cut might be 10 weeks or 12 weeks and that's their opportunity to make the movie that they wanna make. Then they show it to the studio and then there's a preview process where um, for like two or three months, the, as they continue to cut the movie and hone in on what it is that they want to fix and what's working, what's not working, they'll show it to audiences and ask audiences their opinion. Do you, do you feel like the movie's slow in some places? Do you feel like the movie's too fast? Are there things that you don't understand, et cetera, et cetera? And that whole preview process is a big part of finishing a movie. Um, and you might preview in Arizona or Florida or Los Angeles. Los Angeles is tricky because there are so many film related people that you know when in, in the focus group, somebody says in act three, any sentence <laughs> in act three, you know, There's you a have a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, but um, so my job initially is to take music from other movies and build a score for the movie that I'm working on. So, I'll look at a scene and I'll say, okay, this is scene. It starts out with a little comedy and then it needs to get more serious. And then we're gonna to transition to some action music. So I will try to find music that feels appropriate for the movie. Um, so if it's a movie about young people, you know, the, uh, the instrumentation is not gonna be Harry Potter instrumentation. It's gonna be probably more something like from a Fast and Furious movie or something like that. So, so for sad music, you're not going to have the orchestra going, but maybe you'll have some, you know, guitars and things like that, or Fender Rhodes or whatever. And, and basically you, the term is called tracking, but basically what you do is you, you build a score that is what you would do with what you, the best you can do with temporary music so that the scenes play. And, and it's informative in terms of tempo or general vibe, or if it's an action cue, you're gonna hit a few cuts really hard and then you're gonna go out for a second when the guy falls down. 
And then, you know, when he's, when he starts running again, you know, the music comes back there. Now, at, at this point, do you know who the composer of the film is going to you, be? If you use their you music? Might, or? You might, or you might not. And, and I generally don't worry about that because I think that you want to just make the best temp job you can make regardless of who the composer is because it's entirely possible that the composer has not written that score. Well, they for sure haven't written that score, but also, you know, um, it, it's, it's, it's better for all involved if you just pick the best music you could pick. Because I'm just envisioning, you know, you put a bunch of Hans Zimmer like temp stuff in with all the bass and everything, but then it turns out, you know, Thomas Newman or somebody is going to score the film that, you know, has a very different style. Yeah, but but I will say with, with Thomas Newman, um, he did do those, um, he's, a, he's a good enough composer that he did those Bond movies. That's true. He did two or three of the Sam... Um, Mendez Bond movies. So, but at the end of the day, I mean, the temp, the thing is the temp music should tell you about maybe pacing and emotion and some things to hit, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not, it, it shouldn't be the be all and end all of what the music should be. And, and if it's a movie that has a lot of songs, you're gonna start a, a huge experimental process of putting different songs in. Now, obviously, an action movie is different from a, a comedy where with comedies, they might preview a comedy 10 times because they'll be constantly switching in and out jokes and things like that. And it'll be very important for an audience to hear all of this. So you, you do the temping process and you get the movie tempt. And then at some point in time, the composer is going to come and start writing a score. So while they're writing the score, you may be still using temp music for previews and stuff like that. You'll help the composer, making sure they have the most current cut of the picture. And, um, you know, providing them with any information that's helpful and facilitating meetings and when they want to play their, because they'll do synth demos. When they want to do their synth demos, you'll want to um, mix them so that the dialogue and sound effects and everything are at appropriate levels against the music. So you're judging the music not as like a loud piece of music, but as something that's integrated into the film. And, and you'll have meetings and things like that. And, and all these things will always be pre presented to the filmmakers. Okay, because I'm wondering what role does the director play in this? Like this, do, does well, the, the director-, director the, I mean, before the. Me, I'm working with the director and the film editor from the minute I start. And I present material to them. And they'll say, I like this, I don't like this. Could it be more sad? Could it be less sad? I think we need more pace here. We need less pace here. So it's a back and forth. And you might, you might find yourself doing a scene, you know, two or three times, trying to hone in just for the temporary music on what it is they're looking for. Um, I, you know, I mean, if it's a big action sequence, it's not necessarily that that's not a complicated thing to do. I think, you know, comedies and drama scenes, especially where there's a shifting dynamic are more complicated. There's more to think about. And, and sometimes the director just isn't sure what they want and they just want to see some options. They want to see three or four options just so that they can get a general sense about, you know, um, what the scene could be. And sometimes it's good to push a scene too hard musically and break it so you know what the breaking point is. Yeah. So, well, so then the composer starts presenting these demos to the director and film and, and, and film editor and eventually the producers and people like that. And you start putting the demo, as, as they get approved, you start putting them in the movie and they'll be in maybe for the last preview or something like that. And then the next part of the process, and I don't know if you want to go to the Bourne now, or do you want to talk about the next part of the process? Well, I thought maybe we could watch the Bourne um, that's just the uh, the director's cut, and maybe you can talk us through when you saw it, what you decided to do, and then we can- Yeah, so, let's, so, so we're going to listen to part of it and look at part of it without, um, without any music at all 
to get a sense about what a scene is like without music, and then we can compare and contrast it with music. Okay. Why don't you and I both mute ourselves, and then I will share my sure. screen, and we'll watch, uh, I don't know, 90 seconds or so of this uh, scene from Jason Bourne here. I can't hear anything. You know what? It's because I was muted. Hang on a second. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Let me take this back to the beginning. We can see uh, Matt Damon's face again. Here we go. You took a long time to get here, Jason. I know about Beirut. I know what you did. It all ends tonight. <laughs> you didn't come here for revenge. You came here because you know it's time to come in. Your father created the program didn't have what it takes to make it work, and you did. You always did. That's why you volunteered. I volunteered because I thought our enemies killed him. I volunteered because of a lie. No, you volunteered because of who you are. You volunteered because you are Jason Bourne and not David Webb. Thirty-two kills, Jason. There'll be one other man. Those people are all across this country are safer because of what you did. Trying to find another way. <laughs> and how's that working out for you? Okay. Is that a good place to pause? That's a great place to pause. And, and, and now we can watch this, the full scene with, uh, uh, with temporary music. And we can talk about it more afterwards, but okay. check it out and then, and then we can discuss. Okay, let's, uh, we'll watch it now. Uh, so this is your temp score then? This is the, the temp score, yes. Okay, here we go. You took a long time to get here, Jason. I know about Beirut. I know what you did. It all ends tonight. <laughs> I don't hear the music for some reason. For revenge, you came here because you know it's time to come in. Your father created the program. Didn't have what it takes to make it work, and you did. You always did. That's why you volunteered. I volunteered because I thought our enemies killed him. I volunteered because of a lie. No, you volunteered because of who you are. You volunteered because you are Jason Bourne and not David Webb. Thirty-two kills, Jason. Every one of them made a difference. People all across this country are safer because of what you did. I'm trying to find another way. <laughs> and how's that working out for you? never going to find any peace. Not until you admit to yourself who you really are. It's time to come out, Jason. Not for you.
You were never here. You don't have to go after him. This can stop now. You have a choice. I suppose uh, if I was putting audio in a in a chase scene, that might be kind of what I would do. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I think the more interesting thing is the first part, and 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 a lot of the first part was from the Winter Soldier, um, and and what it was, you know, Jason Bourne is there, and he's this guy is his nemesis, and he's there because he believes this guy was. Um, responsible for his father, father's death. So the way he, I approached it was there's a tragedy and tension both. So, you know, you have these cluster chords that are both sad and tense, you know, coming up and down. And then you have these in the heart where the bell is tolling in a sense, not a bell, literally, it's a harp, but the idea, you know, everything has come to bear in this scene. He's been trying to get to Dewey and he's finally there. And, and so, you know, obviously when you cut to the gentleman running into the elevator, you don't, you just, you want, you don't want to like suddenly go to an action cue for like two bars. You want to just, you know, up, up the stakes. So gradually the tension increases, increases, increases until the moment where people start shooting, et cetera, et cetera. And then after that, the question is, well, what is the scene? She has, she has come in and she has saved him. Well, is it upbeat music because she saved him? <laughs> well, no, I mean, no, because at this point, she says, you don't have to do this. And the movie has become a revenge film. And so he's going to go after the other guy. And th this, is, th this, for Jason Bourne, is the turning point of this journey. Because he could stop. Dewey has been stopped. It's essentially over. But no, he, he will now avenge his father's death. And to me, certainly in watching the scene the first time, it was a tragedy. And that music, now the music at the end is from one of the other Bourne movies because he, he wrote those bassoon parts, the um, dee da 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 dee da, da was, was, had always, pardon my bad singing, had always been part of the, um, you know, series. So that, that was an extension of that, but but it's really about, I think the scene's about sadness and about tragedy, because this is a tragic turn of events when it becomes a, a, a revenge film. It's not dark, it's sad. So, so that's kind of, I mean, and, and that's a, a window into my- <laughs> Yeah. Better or for worse process and, 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 and looking at a film and trying to understand what it is that the scene is about. Does that, did, did that make any sense? Yeah. So then after you put this together with the temp tracks, what's the next stage in the so, process? So the next stage in the process is, you know, we'll preview the movie some, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then um, the composer's working away and then it becomes time to record the music. So we will go to a scoring stage in Los Angeles at Fox or Sony or, or Warner Brothers. Or we'll go to London and record at 
um, Air Studios, which is in um, Hampstead or Abbey Road. And typically you'll record for a week or so, depending on the size of the film. The, the new way of doing it, this is not the way John Williams does it, where he records everyone in the room at once, except maybe in an action cue who record the percussion separately. But the new way of recording, <coughs> pardon me, is that you record the strings. Generally, you'll record the strings first. So in the morning, you might have a two, you might have a morning and afternoon string recording session for three hours, and then a brass recording session where you, where you record the brass parts of what were in the strings in the evening. Usually there's less brass music to, to play. So it's usually like two and one. Unless it's John Williams. <laughs> Unless it's John Williams, in which case they did it all together, which yeah. is ideal, but, yeah. <laughs> but not from a practical standpoint. It's just not really, it doesn't really work because, so, so we'll record all the music There'll be an editing process to record all the best takes together. And then generally the person who recorded the orchestra, who's the scoring mixer, will then mix it all. Because generally you'll have, and you may have percussion sessions as well, but there will be synths. So you'll have strings, brass, maybe woodwinds. There'll be synthesizers. There'll be high percussion and low percussion, maybe mid percussion or ethnic percussion or something. There'll be thumpy things like boom, 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 boom. And what you don't want to do is marry a low bass tone to a thumpy thing, because then you don't have any control when you're mixing the film, the final version of the film, which we'll talk about in a minute. You, the idea is to have control. So you might end up going to uh, uh, the final mix of the film, which we'll talk about in a second, with like 10 stems or 12 stems of 5.1, which is left, center, right, left surround, right surround, sub. So the scoring mixer comes up with a set with, 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 when he gets all the elements together, he comes up with something that sounds terrific, but he also knows will work in the film. So the balances are correct. The melody is correct. The, the thumping bass isn't too much. Everything is calibrated. So it just sounds great. And, 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 and you could certainly put that on the soundtrack, that version. Then once that's done, um, I will probably have to make some picture, some changes to the music because they've adjusted the picture. And I'll, I will go in and do those things. Um, I'm usually doing that through the whole process. So generally I'll, there will be a bunch of things that change length, things get longer, shorter. I'll do a conforming process. Then I'll work with the composer and we'll get it all sorted out before the, um, recording sessions. And then there's usually stuff still happening afterwards, especially in visual effects films where the, where, the, where the shots are constantly changing. And then we'll go to mix the movie. So the mixing of the movie is where the dialogue, sound effects and music come together for one final battle. <laughs> or, or as a composer once said, final dubbing is where music goes to die. Yeah. Um, the final boss, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But but what what generally happens is in the old days there it was a three man crew, but now it's usually a two man crew. So there's a uh, usually a mixer who handles the dialogue and music, and a separate mixer who handles the sound effects. And we start integrating all this stuff. So you know you have a scene like the Jason Bourne scene, the the. It's not, you don't just sort of lay it in. You're gonna be constantly moving the levels up and down and up and down around the dialogue, trying to create some drama coming back in waves, things like that. Obviously it becomes, there, there will be issues where during an action scene, they decide to put some EQ on the drums so that they can really cut through in a way that maybe they didn't before. Um, the drums may be simply too loud in a section where there are like metal cranks or whatever, you know, I mean, all that kind of stuff happens. And then, you know, you'll get a reel so it's in pretty good shape and then you'll show it to the director and editor or, or whatever the process is. And um, they'll give us notes. And look, sometimes they may decide that a piece of music that they had approved and lived with, with a long time at the end of the day isn't quite working for them. And if that happens, then 
the first step inevitably is to look through the score and see if there if you have something else that has been used elsewhere that you can repurpose for that scene even if it's only like you know you're only going to use like the strings and synths and not use any of the pulses that were there before but it's the right idea um uh, the right, the right, the right idea from like a sort of a conceptual standpoint or whatever. And then you might go back to the composer and say, hey, I just need X, Y, or Z to make this happen. And you'll do that. I mean, sometimes it's a situation where they want to have a rescoring session and there's nothing that you could have really done about it. But obviously you'll get in there and certainly on the final dub, you'll work with the mixer to try to get levels and try to get things so that they're it's sounding good and you know, because they don't necessarily know the movie as well as you do. Okay, well, let's really try to get this phrase of the strings up a little bit more because it's really going to connect to something that happens later dramatically in the film or whatever. So, so that's sort of the final mixing process. And then at, at some point you'll show it to this to the um, studio and they will have some notes. And the studio has generally been apprised of what's going on musically uh, with the score throughout the process because you know obviously they're paying the bill so it's like it's sort of a uh it, 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 it's a you know it's a collaboration between the studio and the director and the producers so that and that's and that's sort of the process from beginning to end well, Peter, this is just fascinating. And um, we're going to have a chance for the, uh, the attendees to ask questions. And folks, um, if you want to put questions for Peter in the Q&A, um, my assistant, Mr. Carlton Ford, will send those to me. And uh, he's not really my assistant. He's sort of my co-host for this event. But Peter, I have one more question before we start taking questions. Yes, there he is. He's, uh, he's here to help in the beautiful fall setting of Interlochen. Um, I had one more question, Peter, before we um, go to questions from the attendees. Um, you have a, a, the ABC principle that sort of governs your oh, yeah. professional yeah. life. And I thought maybe you could just talk about that for a couple minutes. It, it, it's funny. It's a, it's a term. It's something that I understood conceptually, but nobody had really put it in. It, 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 it's funny. It came from a writer and I will credit Chris Morgan, who wrote the Fast and Furious movies, who I worked with on Hobbs and Shaw, who's been, you know, a very successful writer in Hollywood for a long time. And he's, he, we were talking one day and he said, the guiding principle in Hollywood is ABC, always be cool. And I thought that was a very interesting way to put it. And I'd never really heard anybody put it that way before. But I think that the lesson that one learns in any business that is highly collaborative, like playing in a symphony orchestra or working on a movie or any number of other things, is that being a good citizen and being easy to work with and being cool in the sense of like not freaking out, but also cool in the sense of being somebody that, I mean, I, I have gotten a lot of work. I, it, I, whether I'm competent or not could be discussed you know, <laughs> ad nauseum, but I've gotten a lot of work because people know that I can come into a project and especially helping them come in and quietly help them and help them get to the finish line without dramatics or trying to set up my next job or anything else. And ironically, by not trying to set up my next job or get in with these new people I'm working with, I end up getting more jobs. So, I mean, it, and it speaks to, I think, how you should behave if you're a freelance musician. And, and, and just as a general way to sort of go about business is that if people like you and they know that you can come in and do a good job without grandstanding and making a big deal about everything, they, it, it will serve you well. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know if that made any sense. I feel like I was going on and on. But, um, and it starts, it starts at, at the beginning. And I think that 
my general feeling is most young people would benefit greatly from understanding this. Because I think when you're trying to forge your way in the world, when you're younger, and I, I certainly was guilty of this, you want to sort of make a statement and, and you know, uh, instead of making the statement, let the work be the statement. And, and let everything else just happen. It's that of constantly, the hustle is from doing the work as opposed to- It doesn't mean it's not good to meet people and get yeah. out there, but when you're doing the work, let the work speak for itself. Yeah, always be cool. And when you and I talked before, you, you, you likened this work in a way to being a member of an orchestra. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's like that. I mean, you know, if, if the Ovo has a line and then you have the same line in the trumpet section, there needs to be, you know, th there's a reason they played it that way. And there's a reason you should maybe look at what they were doing and try to emulate that. And if it's not working, maybe you have a conversation about it to figure out what could make it work. Or if you're playing the second trumpet, you're not, I mean, pardon all the trumpet references, your <laughs> job is to help make the first trumpet sound great. Your, your job is not to let everybody know how great you are playing second trumpet. If the trumpet section sounds great, they'll know you were great. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's, I think that that's sort of the way yeah. to look at it. And certainly as a freelancer, just being somebody that people like to have to be around matters a lot more than if you play great. Yeah, and we should we should note for our, our folks in the audience, um, particularly those who haven't quite embarked on a professional career yet, that when you're a freelancer, you're you know your only guaranteed job is the one you have right now, <laughs> and even then, uh, you know, even then it, um, you know, and so. I mean, I, a, a very short story, super short story is this, and, and so, sorry to interrupt you, but I think that, that this illustrates it better than anything. When I played with the CSO, there was a wonderful lady named Betty Eilers who was also playing because we were doing the Firebird and it was all stage stuff. And, and we sort of, we got to know each other and become friends. And she sort of took me under her wing a little bit because I was nice to her and we, we talked and we kind of hung out and it was low key. And I got the Sarasota Opera gig because of her. I didn't even have to audition. Yeah. So. It, that's as, as a freelancer, that's as good an example as anything. Yeah. Well, Peter, we've got some questions that have come in and folks feel free to submit them via the Q&A function and Carlton will send them to me. All right, here's one, Peter. Can you watch your films post-production or in the theater without thinking about the process and enjoying them? Oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, I, I rarely watch a film that I've worked on when I've just finished working on it. That being said, I have watched a few things that I've worked on with my son who's eight. And so um, I might have walked in when he was watching Harry Potter with his mom or whatever. And it's, it's fascinating to watch because oh, <laughs> everything that sort of went down on the film comes back to you and you remember, oh yeah, and yada, yada, yada. So, so, um, and, and there are some films that I like to watch sometimes just because I think that they were very interesting films. I mean, AI being probably not a movie that anybody would think of as being one of Spielberg's best movies, but very <laughs> strange and wonderful in its own right. So I don't know if that answers the question, but as a general, yes, but it's impossible to separate yourself from it. And then you'll hear something and you'll be like, geez, I wish I did that edit better. Or, you know, I, I wish we'd mix the music louder here. I mean, I think that you sort of always remember some of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, here's another question. What does it feel like to see your work out there? Um, you know, it's funny. It, I don't think of it really as my work to a large extent. Um, especially since, you know, the composer obviously writes the final score, which is as it should be. I, 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 when a movie turns out great, I think that you feel proud and glad that it turned out great. But there are so many people involved in the process 
that it's just, I mean, there's a feeling of self satisfaction, of self of satisfaction, knowing that you did a good job and you were part of the team. And, and especially if the movie does well or is well liked by audiences or whatever, I think that you certainly, you feel good about that. Um, so, I mean, it's, it, it feels nice. I mean, if it's like listening to a recording that you worked on that turned out really well, you feel good and you feel glad that you were able to be a part of that. I mean, this isn't really false modesty. I know it probably sounds like false modesty, but it, it's, but, but it is such a team, all these things are such team efforts that I think you're just glad, you know, because if a movie does well, it means that other movies will be made. So even if I worked on movie X and it was competing against movies Y and Z in the same opening weekend, I hope every movie is a success because if every movie is a success, every, everybody's making money, the business will continue and the studios will have money to make another movie. And you can imagine during the last 18 months, or, or I guess it feels like 18 months, it's only been like probably 14. <laughs> yeah. Hundred I mean, years. It's, 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 <laughs> you know, a, a very, very, very tricky situation for the movie studios because they've had extremely high budget films that have not had a proper release. Yeah. So, and so that, particularly, I hope that answers the question in a roundabout way. Yeah, uh, and so um, here, here's another question we have. Um, what's your your favorite um, project that you've done? Your favorite movie, or do you have a favorite? I mean, I have some. I have soft spots for a bunch of the movies. I mean, I think the Harry Potter series was a really. It was a unique thing. It was a fun thing. John wrote just a wonderful scores. And if you were to listen to the score for the Philosopher's Stone, I think it's called, um, or- <laughs> Well, in the US, it's the Sorcerer's Stone. Oh, Sorcerer's Stone, yeah. right, right. And-, and, and Canadian. And you were, <laughs> and you were, you were to, to, to compare that to the third one, um, The Prisoner of Azkaban, those scores are so different. I mean, there are some similarities, but those scores are so different. It's a pretty, it's pretty amazing to think about one composer writing two completely different scores. And, and what Chris Columbus was looking for and what Alfonso Cuaron was looking for were two completely different things. And John showed a flexibility that was like mind boggling. I mean, I loved Angela's Ashes. Um, I thought Alan Parker who directed it, I mean, it, it was not a hugely successful movie because I think everyone compared it to the book which is an impossible task for some movies. But Alan Parker, who was the director, and I ended up going to NEC with his son, interestingly enough, was a quirky guy. He had his, one of his earliest movies was Midnight Express from the 19th, early 80s or late 70s. He was you know, a wonderful filmmaker. And, and I think that some of the people that you sort of meet over the years, are, are as much a part of the process. I mean, Ken Wanberg, who was, you know, my mentor, taught me everything there was to, everything that I am is because of him when it comes to the film industry. I mean, he, the, the knowledge that he imparted on me was, you know, mind boggling. But a, a lot of it is about the people as much as the films. But I think the Potter series was fun. I mean, I think that there, there are other movies that, I mean, of course I'm drawing a complete blank at the moment, but um, <laughs> I mean, I think that every movie has its own sort of interesting things. Mm -hmm. Well, we have some students um, in attendance. And so if, if you, let's say that someone is a high school senior and they wanna be you uh, when they grow up professionally, at least, um, what, uh, what would you suggest to them? What would well, your advice be? The business has changed a lot. Um, and the way I got in was such an anomaly. It, 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 it's, you know, um, the way I got into the business probably wouldn't happen now. But I would say this, probably the best, if you wanted to be a music editor, the best way to do that would be to become a composer's assistant. And as a composer's assistant, you could, um, 
you would you would be in there learning about film and music. I mean, obviously you would need to know the technology. You would need to know Cubase and, and, and you know, all the different programs that composers use for writing. It wouldn't help, it wouldn't hurt to have a composition background. Certainly some lately music editors have been coming in as people who were composition students. A lot of people go to Berkeley or SC. They were composition students and then they just, and they sort of realize that maybe they're not gonna end up with a career as a film composer. So music editor seems like something that's in the same sort of ballpark. But I think that if you work as an assistant for a composer, because we don't really use assistant music editors much anymore, it's a problem. I mean, this is actually a problem and it's a problem that has to get discussed at some point in time with the studios and everyone else, but there's not really a training program where you can really learn how to be a music editor. So in a lot of cases you have folks come in and they become a music editor, but they only know half the job. And I mean, I was very fortunate in the, that I, I, I was sort of introduced to a holistic approach to the job and I had already some other experiences in the background. But I think composer's assistant is the way to go as far as that's concerned now, because I don't think otherwise, unless you try to get in as a sound person, and then flip over to music, which has happened sometimes. But the most important thing, honestly, is to get a well-rounded education. Because well-rounded, you know, individuals who are well-educated are introduced to all kinds of concepts that help in life and, and obviously help, um, you know, in, in, in the industry. I mean, I didn't know anything about film when I got in. So, I mean, it, you could also pursue being an orchestral musician and then decide later you want to try to do this. I mean, you know, especially the young people are so up on technology nowadays that they're, they're certainly in a better position probably than I was uh, from a technological standpoint and certainly than I am now from a technological standpoint. Well, Peter Miles, thank you so much. This has been absolutely fascinating and we just really appreciate you uh, taking this hour to talk with us about your career. Uh, any last, no pressure here, but any last words that you kind of want to send us off with before we wrap up? Well, I, you know, my last words are, I think interlocking is, there's, I mean, we all know that there's no place like it, but there is no place like it. And whatever we can do to support Interlochen, and you know, as we make our way as alumni, and I mean, you can support a place in many different ways, financially and otherwise. I know Carlton will like this part. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Carlton. Yeah. Uh, Carlton will be available to discuss this with anyone <laughs> afterwards. <too. laughs> but if you're at Interlochen, I, I congratulate you for. Um, becoming involved with one of the most magical places really there is on the planet. And I don't think I would have, I, I would not have gone on the journey I went on had I not gone to Interlochen. It would have been a different journey. Maybe it would have ended up here, maybe it wouldn't have. But I think the opportunities that you have there, the people that you meet, the lifelong friends, um, it's, it's a one of a kind thing. If you're a student there, enjoy it. If you love public radio, support it. If you love the academy and the camp, support it. And thank you so much for having me. This is fun. I, um, I hope this was at least interesting and, and you know, the, 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 uh, a fun hour for everybody. I certainly enjoyed it. And I wish you all the best. Stay healthy and safe. Well, thank you very much, Peter Miles. And thanks to all of you uh, who attended today. We'll try to put the video up uh, of this conversation later. And uh, I'm going to turn this into something for a radio broadcast for all of us as well. And since you set me up so nicely, I should mention that IPR's spring drive for listener support uh, starts this Thursday, but you can get out in front of it right now at interlockandpublicradio.org. Uh, how'd I do there, Carlton? <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay. We'll never watch a film the same way again. <laughs> oh, I know. I, I was saying that uh, I think we should watch one of the Bourne movies at my house tonight. I think that would be uh, 
be a good a good use of our time to apply all of the all the things I've learned. And yeah, I it would just be fascinating to watch a film with your temp track and then watch it. One hopes that it's elevated greatly by the score in every case. <laughs> Great. Well, again, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you uh, who came along today. And uh, I'm going to figure out how to, how to end this right now. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, everybody.